Welcome to Small Biz Matters with Alexi Boyd. Whether you're listening live on the Community Radio Network or via podcast, here's the show where you learn from experts, be inspired by journeys, and discover more about making your small business a success. I'm Alexi Boyd, broadcaster, advocate, and small business owner. Let's meet today's guest. So you couldn't get more topical than this at the moment. Equality, fairness, equity in the workplace. Our country's leaders have failed us, so the small business community can become the leaders in this space and embrace a new philosophy around fair and equitable discussions. Or can they? The reality is many small businesses don't even know what their obligations are, let alone how to be equitable, fair and equal when engaging with others. But today's guest might be able to help us with this. I found her on social media to be refreshing at a time when I felt only disappointment and dissolution in the way that our country was being run. Her thought-provoking posts led me to invite her on Small Biz Matters to help us tackle this important topic. Kathy is passionate about equity and equality in the speaking space and was disappointed to find that the traditional speakers agencies and bureaus tended to only feature celebrities and professional speakers and getting the same perspectives over and over again, just repackaged differently. So she founded Keynote Worthy, which aims to seek diversity and inclusion on stage. And she joins us today to share her own small business journey and help us small business owners to see things differently, or rather, equitably. Welcome to the show, Kathy. Good morning. Thank you. It's lovely to have you here in the studio. Always great to have people live and in person when we are uh, talking about all things fair and equitable because it would be quite tricky to do it over, over I know. Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is uh, not a very sexy topic, so it is uh, a pleasure to be here in person today. Indeed, but it's so important because, you know, our everyday lives in small business are constantly... It's about engaging with others, whether it be our clients, whether it be our employees, whether it be our contractors or other key stakeholders. We basically do have a a really important relationship that we build with others, and we do that well. We're not like this giant corporate machine that doesn't actually speak to other people. We really make sure that we build those relationships up. So can we assume that small business does fair and equitable perfectly? No, unfortunately (laughs) not. Damn it. (laughs) (laughs) I mean... I think it's a, an important conversation to have right now because of what's happening around the world. But also the fact is that a third of small business owners are actually migrants. So, um, you know, small businesses form the fabric of our economy. It's part of the community. So when you support, su- support small businesses, um, like there's a meme that goes around that says they're doing like a little dance in the corner or something like that. So for me, I make a conscious decision to, for example, buy my milk from my local bakery because I know that it's supporting uh, the lady there and her family who have been there for over 20 years serving the community and bringing this fresh, delicious bread. So, um, you know, things like that bring me joy as well and I feel like it's the right thing to do Uh, so we as consumers vote with our money so it's not just about you know diversity inclusion and all that kind of corporate jargon speak it's about serving the community thinking about who our customers are and just helping each other out Mm. and that's how communities I suppose are built with small businesses as being the backbone and sort of the beating heart because they're often the ones who are supporting the local sports team or there for others when they need it or opening their doors um, during a catastrophe for example You, you raise a really good point there. But uh, you, uh, I'm interested to see how the, dis- the point you made about migrant families. With um, migration, obviously, from different countries and different cultures, people bring with them an expected cultural norm, which may or may not necessarily fit in what happens in the rest of Australian society. So do, does that, is that a little bit clunky sometimes, the way that um, certain cultures engage with one another or with, with the broader Australian community? Does that make it a little bit um, tricky and a bit difficult in terms of jumping those hurdles? So I would really question what really is the Australian culture because Australia is ba- is founded on stolen land. So it, that's my first question and it's a very loaded question which uh, we probably don't have time to answer today, but that's more of a rhetorical question at the moment. Uh, secondly... I think, I mean, everyone has their own cultural norms and expectations, um, you know, whether that be through our own upbringing and also what we expect from a business as well. Uh, Essentially, what I like to do is just to really get to know them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes people can have a bad day. Sometimes people can have a good day. And um, 
you know, it's just just have a conversation and learn about each other and other cultures. Um, it's not just about, uh, you know, the, the ethnic culture, but just, you know, how did you start your business? Like, why did you want to be self-employed? Like, you know, just little things like that and getting to know each other. I think that we as a society right now are just... You know, loneliness is an epidemic right now and it's. I think it's because we don't really know our neighbours. We don't really talk to each other. We would rather engage with our phones. So, um, you know, just have a conversation and, and I think, yeah, that's just so important as a first step for inclusion and in, in getting to know each other. Yeah, absolutely, because when you think about the inclusivity, it's not just about picking and choosing who you befriend, but you're in a community with a wide range of values and cultures and beliefs um, and bringing them all together, but also not just shoving them in one space, but actually making that connectivity and, and building those relationships we have to do that ourselves. We can't have that forced upon us, right? Yeah, that's right. Like no one's just going to tap you on the show and say, hey, can you please talk to your neighbour or, <laughs> or something like that? You know, just, you know, back in the days, you remember like when someone moved into a neighbourhood, you would, I don't know, bake them an, um, a pie or something like that. I don't really see that anymore. People are just, you know, closed up and... Um, I kind of digress here, but I, I kind of felt that during, well, we are still in the pandemic at the moment, but being of Asian heritage, it just made me so self-conscious to be around people because I don't know if they're looking at me because I'm Asian or because they're just, I don't know, going about their own day or something like that. So, yeah. So you question yourself when you're walking around because you feel in any way different? That's right, yeah. And it's it's sad because I feel Australian just like anyone else. So, I mean, my my accent is, is very much Australian. Uh, so sometimes when people see me in real life, they're like, oh, they just, they just, oh. Oh. <laughs> and I kind of know what that oh is. Uh, but... Yeah, it's just it's just sad that I kind of question, you know, what it what does it mean to be Australian? Like do you have to look a certain way? Like I I don't want to question that because I'm born here and you know, pretty much have the same rights and as everyone. I pay my taxes. <laughs> so, yeah. and I go down to the local shop and buy my milk. I do. I buy my milk and bread from the local uh, bakery. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Kathy, is this what was one of the things that um, I guess inspired you to start Keynote Worthy? Tell me about um, that inclusive approach that you had and what were you frustrated with that you were trying to change in the industry? Well, I started it by accident. So, I mean, really in the ideal world, I don't want to start a business like that because it was founded more on an advocacy sort of angle. Uh, it was because I was just so frustrated of seeing the same faces all the time. And I felt that there was this personal responsibility for me to do something about it. And I always tell people um, when I can and when appropriate, like always assume responsibility. Like if you see something out there like domestic violence, um, harassment out in the street, assume personal responsibility for that because your actions matter. Uh, it's not just about raising awareness on matters, uh, but it's about doing something about it. And it, it is hard and it takes a lot of courage and guts and you have to feel safe to do so. But, but anyway, uh, in the ideal world, Keynote Worthy does not exist. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I started it while uh, employed uh, at a, another company and I felt that that was a sustainable way to you know get income on the side while also building the business so it's um, coming up to almost two years now um, last year was was fairly challenging because uh, keynote with is in the events industry so a lot of business uh, a lot of events sorry were um, you know cancelled and moved virtually so uh, it was a big learning experience for everyone but on top of that it was also um you know compounded by the racism around the world which made it really hard on me mentally as well like I'm trying to build a business but also deal with all the the, the hatred in the world mm. surrounding coronavirus so but yeah so right now I'm completely self-employed and yeah very very happy to be self-employed um, it's not to say that I will never ever go back into the corporate world it's just uh, right now I feel as though I need to invest all my energy into this uh, yeah 
And what, what problem are you trying to solve in the events industry when you start a keynote worthy? Well, when I first started, it was more around providing a solution for event organisers to find diverse keynote speakers out there. Yeah, diverse is a pretty loaded yep. word. What what do you mean by diverse? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. So when I say diverse, I mean a variety of you know people from different backgrounds, sexualities, experience, age, ethnicity, abilities, and the list goes on. So at the moment in the events and conferences that you go to, it's kind of all the same. And when I say the same, I think you can read between the lines. It's quite homogenous, you know, normally middle-aged straight men. (laughs) <laughs> dominate pale the stage. male and stale. Pale male and stale. <laughs> that's that's correct. And you also get a lot of panels that are all men as well. Even for International Women's Day, as an example, we've seen a lot of panels with men as well. I, I do understand sometimes. You know, you do need the male. You do need the male perspective in it as well, in terms of how to be a good champion of change, how to be Mm. an ally for change. Yes. However, when the conversation is dominated by the same narrative, that becomes a problem. So it's not just about diversity of ethnicity or ability or, you know, those things we usually associate with diversity and inclusivity. But it's also, I think you're saying, a diversity in conversation. Yeah, that's right. Diversity in conversation, perspective and thought. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you another example. Last year, there was a data event. Uh, it was more aimed at marketing professionals. And when you look at stats, uh, a lot of marketing professionals are skewed more to uh, women. Yes, Except, they are. Yeah, yeah a lot of marketing women. managers are women or women identified. It's only, I guess, when you get to the C-suite level that it, it might be a different story. But this event started off with all men doing the keynote speak. And it becomes a problem when it's just the dominant voice. Mm. Um, It's not to say that, you know, they're not credible and, you know, I'm not questioning their expertise or anything like that. I question the curation of all the speakers uh, because ultimately these events are trying to solve a problem. You know, it's not just about putting bums on seats and satisfying sponsors and and all of that. It's about serving a need. So that the need of that particular event is how to have better data making decisions in Mm. your everyday life whether that is small business or you know in your role that's what it is it's simple as that so um yeah I I called it out and you know of course people got really defensive saying that I was questioning the um the speaker's credibility and all of that. Who was the pushback coming from? Was it coming from the industry itself or was it coming from the speakers? It was coming from the organisers. Because, yeah. it, but I'm, I'm assuming that part of their pushback was we haven't got time, and this is a big one with the events industry, to go out there and research properly and find the right people and explore other options because it's so easy to just pick up the phone and ring all of last year's speakers and get them to come again and have the same conversations again. So maybe the pushback is because of a lack of time in the industry or am I just making excuses for people who can't be bothered <laughs> making an effort? Well, I think they don't have time. Like event organisers are time poor, like most people, but they're always scrambling and, you know, meeting this deadline and and logistics and everything. So that goes behind it. But I think it's just laziness, but they don't admit it. Like no one wants to admit that they're lazy, but they also make the excuse of, oh, well, I called out to everybody, but no women put their hand up. Yeah, I hear that a lot in the events industry and I'm going to call bollocks on that because... I myself, when I've organised panels for various events, I've never had anybody say no. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's it's BS, definitely. <laughs> but, you know, I, I get where they're coming from. But also, um, you've got a question, okay, is, was your call-out inclusive? Did you use language specifically that kind of deterred people away? Mm. Um, did you try hard enough? How long did you do the call out for? Mm. Or did you do the call out just in vanity to show that you are considering external applicants or, or whatever it is? So, uh, yeah, I really question that. Um, and I do feel that it, it is BS. There's so. also a bit of a process to this as well, because I've noticed with big conferences, what they'll do is they'll, they'll pop up 
the speakers as they become available or as, as, they're, as they're confirmed and they'll pop their, their um, headshots up there. And I suppose part of the effort should be making sure the first few headshots have a range of exclu- in- inclusivity and have the right the right balance of all those different people. And then other people will feel comfortable. Like maybe a woman isn't going to say, oh, I'm not going to be the first woman to put my hand up, so I'll just wait. Yeah, yeah. That, Is it the same right. with others with other ethnicities or other abilities, for example? Yeah, well, then, you know, the, the dreaded imposter syndrome kicks mm. in. You know, like if you see the, the sea of same faces, you're going to be like, oh, goodness me, like, oh, I don't really belong up there. So my voice does not deserve to be up there. So I'm going to shy away. And that's what happens um, consciously and unconsciously as well. So what is the best way to engage with a new speaker? Say you're organising a conference, you might be part of a professional association, you're doing it yourselves. What is the best way to frame that conversation to invite someone new and different um, onto a panel or as a keynote? Well... (laughs) <laughs> well, you can get in touch with me um, by Keynote Worthy or I think just the traditional, you know, asking someone, you know, a call out on LinkedIn, say, um, you know, just think about who's missing in your panel or who's missing in your lineup and just say, hey, I want to, um, you know, find a speaker with the X, Y, Z background. Uh, can anyone help? And you'd be really surprised on LinkedIn and when you call out, um, even on Facebook groups as well, people are so generous and willing to help. Um, they always want to, you know, uh, recommend a, a certain person or, um, you know, refer you to someone that might know someone. So um, that's true, know. actually. It's never like, oh, I'll do this, but you have to give me 10% or something. That never comes up. But people are always willing to put other people forward and say, hey, you should you should go for this because it'll be a really good opportunity for you. Yeah, that's right. And like I, I read this somewhere, but, you know, when people do that publicly on LinkedIn or Facebook, it gives them a kick as well like a um it's kind of like when you tick off checklists (laughs) when you finish something off it's that same sort of kick when you're helping someone it's it's yes partly that vanity as well like in the public forum but yeah people are willing to help others so you know ask for help and allow extra time to curate all these speakers don't do it in the last minute because when you do it in the last minute, you're going to do a sloppy job. Yeah, exactly. So if you're going to an event and you've been asked to speak and you may think that your angle is a little bit different from others, what are some top tips you'd give for someone who's a little bit unusual and different from the usual lineup of speakers to prepare for um, speaking at such an event? What are some of the things, you, what are the do's and the don'ts of creating a speech, for example? Uh, sorry, is this for the speaker or the, the speaker? Organizer? Say, for example, you're someone who's coming at it from a different angle. You may have a, a completely different opinion to what usually happens at this conference. What do you suggest to people like that who are a bit different? Yeah, so for speakers, I would recommend really understanding who the audience is. Um, like that's any speaker, really. Um, understand who your audience is and... Uh, you almost have to tailor your speech every time. Like you could have the same theme, but you need to alter it slightly to be um, for them to resonate with it as well. Uh, but also you want them to feel challenged as well. So if you're a new speaker, you'll need to practice a lot uh, and practice in front of the right person. So you wouldn't, if your mother is not the right audience, then don't practice in front of her, uh, practice uh, in front of someone who would be that that audience. That's, um, yeah, practice, practice, practice. And, yeah, just sense check with them as well. So, um, I mean, you don't have to practice in person. It could be on Zoom mm. um, as well. Like, you know, these days with technology, it just makes it so easy. Uh, and then check your own bias as well. I think sometimes, because um, I've done stand-up comedy in the past um i'm not doing it so much these days but there are some jokes where i've tested and if i thought it was funny and it didn't go so well in front of um, a particular person so then i had to go back and change it so it's the same thing with speaking as well public speaking you need to just keep on tweaking fine-tuning it um, and yeah, when you're new, you need to do it a lot more. If, if you're brought on clearly because you are different to the others, do you suggest that that becomes a highlight, that you make it part of your shtick, or is it better to just ignore the fact that you're different because everyone's trying to be inclusive? 
oh, I think just, you know, show it off. And I think to make it easier for event organisers, just tell them, like, I think this particular trait is quite quirky. I recommend that you, you know, write, write, make it easy for them, write the copy for them, the mm. content for them. Just say, uh, Kathy with rad pink hair or something. I don't have pink hair at the moment. But <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just talking at the top of my head, but, you know, just saying something quirky um, and, you know, just intriguing just to get the audience curious yes. and looking forward to um, your keynote. Yeah, just in terms of a practical thing, I, w- I would say that it's a good idea to write your introduction. It's one of my pet hates is when you go up on stage and someone's, I don't know, read something off a LinkedIn page that's about three years old because you haven't bothered to update it. You always write how you want to be introduced. And sometimes in certain forums, you might say, I'll oh, just say my name and I'll introduce myself. Mm. Um, or others, you might give them like a two or three line intro so yeah. that you don't have to do it. Yeah, that's a really good advice. Um, I have a template where I have my headshots, my bio, and I have my bio in a few different versions, Mm. one that's a bit more corporate, one that's a bit more fun. So it really depends, again, on the audience. So really, um, yeah, understand them and and who they are. And I have it saved in a central file so that it's easy to access. So whenever someone asks me, I can just send it straight away. It it just makes it easy. Well, we might take a quick break here on Small Biz Matters and we're going to listen to some community service announcements. When we come back, I want to talk to you about the ever so complex world of pronouns. Now, anybody out there who's got teenage kids will know exactly what I'm talking about and I'm hoping to get some advice from you, Cathy, because this is what a lot of your um, discussions on social media and particularly LinkedIn, again, that's why I brought you on the show, are interesting and diverse in this opinion and it's great to hear from someone like you. You're listening to Triple H 100.1 FM. We'll be back after this. This episode of Small Biz Matters is proudly sponsored by the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman's Office. Since its establishment only four years ago, Aspifio has provided education, advocacy and support, including free assistance if a small business is involved in a dispute. The office also provides assistance for disputes that fall under the franchising, dairy, horticultural and oil industry codes. As an independent advocate for small business owners, Aspifio has the legislative power to influence our nation's lawmakers, ensuring legislation and regulations are put in place to help small businesses grow and in these times survive. Small businesses are the engine room of the economy and it's Aspifio's role to do all they can to ensure they have the freedom to innovate, employ and thrive well into the future. So today we're in the studio with Kathy No, who is the uh, founder of Keynote Worthy. She found a real need in the events industry to fill the gap of diversity and inclusiveness, inclusivity, inclusiveness, uh, and to make sure that people who appeared on stage or in panels or were speakers or who were experts actually reflected the community in which they lived and operated in. And it's something that she's very passionate about and we've been speaking about before the break. But now I want to speak to Cathy about running a small business and why you need to be conscious of inclusivity. I mean, I guess, Cathy, we have a duty of care to our employees, for starters, and uh, and, and a duty of care to those who work around us and beside us in our business. Why is it so important that you have to think of inclusivity, inclusivity when running a business or growing a business? businesses have in their values customers are at the heart of the core of the business <laughs> but they are they are your customers are all from different backgrounds right and so you need to speak their language not you know literally speak their language but um, it's just going back to you know your marketing personas your um, who you're serving understand who you're serving and what their needs are you know it's not just a it's not about your needs at the end of the day you know, for me, I'm also a writer. So when I write for other businesses, I don't write for me. I write for their customers and I really need to understand their customers intimately. Mm. So if you really care about customer service, you want to understand your customers intimately. And that involves inclusion. Same as your employees as well. And I would hope that your employees are all from different backgrounds as well. Because when your employees are all from different backgrounds, then they can relate to their customers more. And when I say the word relate, it's about empathy. You know, sometimes, um, but you know, just, just think about the buying decisions, going back to basics. Are they buying this, um, you know, flowers is, is just a very emotional 
process as well. It could be happy emotions, sad emotions. So really, if you are understanding the intent about, you know, why they're buying the flowers, it just makes the experience a lot more magical. Yeah, that's a really good example, actually. And and you're right. It's not just about understanding the culture of who's out there, but the empathy. You, you, You can't be empathetic about everything to do with all of your customers unless you're I guess, filling the gaps and making sure that your staffing is reflective of who your customers are. That's a really good way to nail it. Mm. I wanted to ask you as well in terms of a duty of care. I mean, we know that we are obliged as employers to not discriminate from one ethnicity or one ability or gender from another. Um, But beyond that, when someone is working for you, does it come down to how you treat them as well? Absolutely. So employers have a duty of care to all their staff and this includes not just physical safety but psychological safety as well. So, um, you know, staff members can, they can put a discrimination claim or a bullying claim towards you. It's a reputational risk um, as well as obviously an HR risk as well for all businesses. So um, you do have a duty of care but treat your staff like humans. You know, they're not just not rocket science. <laughs> I know it's not rocket science. You know, like like everyone, we have good days, we have bad days, and during this pandemic, it's been you know quite difficult for everyone. Um, everyone has different circumstances, so it's just treating people like human at the mm. end of the day. So yeah take care of your staff and they will take care of you and your business. Yeah, very good point there. Look, um, Kathy, I'd like to thank you so much for coming on the program. It's been an awesome discussion and something I was really looking forward to in the current media landscape and um, an important discussion that we all have to have and, and think about. Tell us how people can find out about Keynote Worthy and about yourself. Well, you can find me on LinkedIn under Kathy Ngo uh, or also keynoteworthy.com.au. Check it out and support Fantastic. Look, thank you so much for joining us today. Everyone, you've been listening to Triple H 100.1 FM here for Small Biz Matters. If you've missed any of today's program, you can, of course, catch up via iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your small business education podcast. There are over 207 podcasts to choose from on any conceivable topic. But if you think we've missed something, get in touch and we will uh, look at having an expert on the show to answer your questions. You've been listening to Small Biz Matters here with Alexi Boyd. We'll be back next week with another great guest. Thanks for joining me. This week's episode was proudly broadcast from Triple H Studios in Sydney, Australia and sponsored by the Office of the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman. If you've enjoyed listening, go ahead and give us some thank you stars on your podcasting platform. It would be much appreciated. Then head to the Small Biz Matters website where you can listen to over 170 episodes, read more about our speakers and find out how to become a media partner. See you all next time. Bye.